Uh, morning, everyone. Welcome to Cornerstone Barristers um, series on local plans. Um, this morning, we're dealing with SA, SEA and spatial strategies. And um, the team we have this morning include myself. And if we move to the next slide, we'll see um, stunning pictures of both Rob Williams and Emma Dring. Um, Rob is going to deal with the sustainability appraisal and SEA process. Emma's going to deal with habitats regulation assessment. And I'm going to start the morning off introducing with uh, the Guildford case and then trying to draw some overarching lessons from that for the practical management of the, both these subjects, which the others will then pick up on. Uh, the, uh, as our introductory slide said, our slides and, uh, will be available on our website soon afterwards and we're recording this broadcast so the recording should also be available on, on YouTube and via the website. Um, <clears throat> thank you for your questions and answers so far. Um, we'll try and pick up uh, many of those during the course of the presentation. If you have further questions please ask them and we'll see if we can get to them at the end. We're hoping to leave at least 10 to 15 minutes for question and answer. Uh, we'll see how long it takes. There's a fair amount to cover uh, to get through this morning. Um, <clears throat> so um, with that uh, introduction, uh, we'll move to my part of the slide, uh, my part of the presentation. And I I'm, uh, first of all, make a plug for our future sessions. Um, in, on the 16th of July, joint planning across authority lines with Michael Bedford and Ashley Bowes. Then on the 23rd, Greenbelt release with Paul Shadareven, Jonathan Clare and Wayne Beglan. And then on the 30th, viability and funding infrastructure, particularly in relation to garden communities, Michael Bedford again, Wayne Beglan again, and Claire Parry making a, an appearance. So um, the joining uh, instructions are absolutely the same as for this, and we hope that together the uh, webinars will provide assistance to all of you who are going through uh, or taking part in a, a local plan production at this stage. So for that, then turning on to Guildford, um, I, I <coughs> uh, was in, got involved in Guildford from um, 2015 onwards. Uh, um, in their production of their most recent local plan. Um, the plan was adopted uh, in April um, and there was a challenge April last year and a challenge which led to the case report that you can see um, under review. Uh, and uh, eight issues were raised in the case of which we'll only deal with two this morning. Others may be raised in subsequent seminars. Five QCs turned up in court and six other barristers and one judge. And, and that is, I raise that because that's perhaps an indication that however you play these matters, however much care you put into them, they're likely to be highly contentious. And the two of the five QCs were for local residents and the Greenbelt groups. Two of the QCs were for developers and then there was uh, myself in the middle. Uh, with luckily attended by Rob, who uh, kept me on a straight and narrow. Um, the <coughs> both subjects we're dealing with today can provide hard-edged questions of law on, about which people who are disappointed with the outcome of the plan can raise a challenge. And um, our purpose today, if there's an overall purpose, is trying to smooth those hard edges and make the questions uh, that arise from the um, sustainability appraisals from habitats regs issues soft edge questions of law so matters of soft edge questions so matters of planning judgment with which the court would interfere now as i indicated guildford uh, compton and guildford raised uh, eight issues eight grounds of challenge uh, the ground of challenge dealing with sustainability appraisal was reached by paragraph 108, albeit taken early, it was issue seven, and it arose um, because of the change to the housing numbers that 
featured during the course of the case. And this is a matter that Rob is going to deal with in a little bit more detail later on uh, in the essay, but this is by way of introduction. The housing number is reduced from 12,426 to 10,678 as a result of updated household projections. Which came out mid-plan examination. Now the claimant asserted there should have been a further appraisal examining reasonable alternatives. And um, uh, that was the basis of their challenge. Now, Guildford um, produced a note after those um, numbers changed, setting out to the inquiry to examination why no further essay was needed and, and in also no, why no further consultation was needed on the reduced OAN. So essentially, its case was its strategy had remained the same. It was OAN and buffer, and the buffer had increased in size, but it was still uh, the ba same basic strategy. The uh, inspector accepted that approach, albeit it, it's important to note that the decision is Guildford's. Um, it's the council's, whichever council is doing it, um, but the inspector endorsed that approach both um, in terms of the debate at the various sessions and in his subsequent report. Um, the ground of challenge was rejected um, by Mr. Justice Easley. He found there was no change to the objectives uh, and the um, <clears throat> alternative of OEN with no buffer, which is what some of the uh, challengers were arguing, um, uh, had been rejected earlier on in the SA process. So uh, <clears throat> he also made it clear that whether a change in the buffer was a significant change, so needing to uh, be investigated further, uh, likely to have significant effects or not was a matter of planning judgment. And it's well known that such decisions can only be challenged on public law grounds. So uh, <clears throat> in his view, the judgment that the change wasn't significant was reasonable. Uh, and it's important to note that the challenge was also rejected as a matter of discretion as well. So even if he found there'd been an error of law, he would have refused the challenge uh, as a matter of discretion. And whilst um, the uh, claimant sought to permission to appeal uh, his decision on a couple of grounds, it's interesting to note they it didn't include either this ground or the Habitat's regs ground. Uh, permission to appeal, by the way, was refused. So that, that's the SA ground in, in short order. The Habitat's ground is issue eight, um, never necessarily the strongest issue to have issue eight out of eight issues, um, but sometimes the last issue can succeed. In this case, it didn't. It concerned air quality and appropriate assessment, and then the, uh, whether the HRA had been properly updated, the Habitat for Eggs Assessment was properly updated to take into account both Sweetman, which uh, came, the ECJ judgment and that came out after the initial versions of the assessment were brought out, and whether it had been properly updated to deal with Holohan and the Dutch nitrogen cases, about which Emma will say um, more later. Uh, the issue in Guildford was whether um, they do, well, initially the issue was whether they dealt appropriately with the uh, anticipated decline in background air quality arising from matters such as the reduction in diesel cars, and whether that could be considered in the assessment uh, and how that tied in with issues of mitigation. Again, in, in uh, Guildford's case, the challenge um, was rejected. The challenge was uh, eventually honed in on whether the um, equated forecast background improvements, uh, <coughs> uh, sorry, my apologies. The challenge was pursued on the basis that exceedances of critical loads at, at roadside edges meant that adverse effects were likely. Uh, the court rejected that. Uh, the assessment properly considered whether such exceedances not just would occur, but whether they would have significant impacts on SPA birds. Uh, Guildford had acted uh, lawfully and reasonably. Um, it, it's perhaps important to note just before we leave this slide that the, um, the Guildford had continually updated its um, 
habitat terrain assessment throughout and it had um, concentrated on um, and it had carried out an actual assessment. It's not a case on screening um, whether an assessment is needed or not. Uh, an assessment had occurred and they had carried out that assessment. And, and in my view, that's likely the case uh, for most plans. So what, what lessons um, to be learned from that quick run through and we're going to try and uh, deal with today? First of all, it, it's vital to keep uh, both these subjects under review as the plan progresses. Uh, and Rob's going to deal with a case where that didn't occur. Uh, secondly, it's important to react appropriately. And uh, coming back to the SA challenge, uh, what Guildford did was when the numbers changed, uh, perhaps slightly late in the day, um, a note was produced for the inspector um, setting out how it intended to react to the change in housing numbers, why it didn't think further appraisal was necessary and further consultation was necessary. Um, and allied to that, keep the inspector informed and other parties informed. Um, the two final points on this before I hand over to Rob. Firstly, um, th this is, well, as in all cases with the development of a plan, some decisions you take earlier on in the process can come back to haunt you uh, if they're uh, in error. But there are, is the possibility in both these subjects to correct such errors if they arise. Uh, and secondly, if you keep other parties informed as well as the inspector, you will have some reaction from them which is what happened in Guildford, and then you can gauge from that reaction and react to it yourself so that you can again take steps to try and ensure that um, your assessments, your appraisals uh, are up to date, deal with the appropriate matters and don't just dismiss um, uh, complaints about the adequacy of your assessment as ill-founded without uh, proper investigation. So with those three um, lessons, main lessons in mind, I'll now hand over to Rob. Thanks James, and, and as James said, I'm going to be dealing with the, the SA uh, process uh, and we're going to have a quick canter through uh, four topics. Uh, first of all, the role the SA plays at the examination stage. Secondly, the core principles involved in the SA. Thirdly, uh, picking up on a topic that, that James mentioned, curing defects in the SA uh, uh, post uh, submission and prior to adoption, and then fourthly, the recent Leeds City uh, Council case where a site allocations policy was held to be unlawful, uh, amongst other things, on SEA grounds. Now, there is a degree of overlap uh, with the webinar I gave with Michael Bedford and Wayne Beglin about a month ago, and so I'll take those points quickly. <clears throat> if you are interested in them, uh, the recording is available uh, on the website. Um, Turning then to the role of the essay at the examination. Uh, <clears throat> at examinations, inspectors focus on an essay uh, for two main reasons. Firstly, to assess whether the uh, essay itself is legally adequate, and secondly, as part of their determination whether the plan is sound. Now, <clears throat> I no doubt that many of you have been to a large number of local plan examinations, and you'll know that sometimes the sustainability appraisal is front and centre of the examination, and it comes up repeatedly in a large number of issues, and sometimes it's discussed on the afternoon of day one after due to cooperate and then hardly referred to at all. And to some extent, that depends on the, the plan itself uh, and the local authority promoting it and what uh, importance they place on the essay as compared to other uh, evidence based such as topic papers. And to some extent, that it depends on the examining inspector. Some inspectors treat the essay as a critical piece of evidence central to the evaluation of soundness, others more of a cross-check or sense-check. <clears throat> but whatever the approach, uh, all inspectors will consider whether the uh, essay is legally adequate, and it's one of their re requirements under Section 20 of the 2004 Act. And sometimes uh, the inspectors will be a staging post for arguments which will then be advanced in the High Court, and you'll see uh, opinions by learned counsel, often QCs, uh, flung around about the adequacy or otherwise of the uh, essay. Uh, the big difference uh, when you're dealing with the legal adequacy of the essay at this stage, at the examination stage, is that you can, in principle, cure any defects at this stage. 
once the plan is adopted, you can't. Moving on to <coughs> its role in terms of soundness. Uh, as a matter of law, uh, it's been held that the SA uh, process is entirely procedural in nature. And that's in contrast to the, the HRA and the appropriate assessment under the uh, Habitats regulations, which Emma will talk about in due course. Um, in contrast to that, an, an essay informs decision making, it doesn't dictate it. If we move on to the next slide, in practice and in policy, actually the essay often forms a key part of the evidence base against which the soundness of a plan is tested. Uh, it, it impacts on the substantive question the inspectors have to ask themselves, is the plan sound? And the most obvious example is when an inspector is asking him or herself whether the plan is justified. Obviously, if there's a robust sustainability appraisal which supports that the plan's strategy is the most or one of the most sustainable options when considered against reasonable alternatives, that goes a long way to ensuring the tests of soundness are met. And that's expressly uh, recognised, or the role of the SA in uh, the soundness test is expressly uh, recognised in the PPG. Moving then on to core principles, and um, I've set out in the next slide um, a, a recap of some of the core principles which are applicable to uh, sustainability proposals, which are derived either from the uh, directive and regulation themselves or uh, case law interpreting uh, uh, those instruments. Now, I have to say that this isn't an exhaustive list of all relevant uh, principles. And in the previous uh, webinar that I gave, I, I uh, went into a reasonable amount of depth um, about these principles. I won't repeat myself now. Um, what I want to focus on is the court's approach uh, to uh, challenges that are brought on the basis of failure to comply with the SEA directive and with failure to comply with these principles. And in particular, the Plan B uh, case. Uh, the Plan B Earth case, uh, it was a challenge to, um, it is, it's ongoing, uh, permission to appeal has been granted to the Supreme Court. It's a challenge to the airport's national policy statement. Um, and that concerned, as you know, uh, the uh, proposed third runway at Heathrow. Now, the Court of Appeal's decision was handed down in February of this year. And um, it's fair to say that is a tour de force. It, it runs to some 83 pages, 285 paragraphs, and a, a very wide ranging grounds were taken, even in the Court of Appeal. Even uh, broader grounds were run in the High Court originally. Now, just deviating for one moment from SEA, uh, on, in Plan B, as I'm sure you're all aware, the uh, challenge succeeded on one topic, and that's climate change. And in short, the Court of Appeal held that by the time the uh, ANPS was being produced, the Paris Agreement, which committed to uh, reducing increase in global average temperatures by 2050, the Paris Agreement by that time was part of government policy. It wasn't just an international agreement. And the court held that the failure to take the Paris Agreement into account as a relevant consideration and the Secretary's State accepted that he hadn't taken into account um, as a consideration. The failure to do so was in breach of Section 58 of the Planning Act 2008, which required uh, governments when producing the national policy statements to uh, have regard to government policy on climate change. Now, as I say, permission to appeal has been granted to the Supreme Court, um, granted to Heathrow Airport. Interestingly, the government didn't seek to appeal uh, themselves. And on this point, we had a question from Catriona Gattrell from uh, North Yorkshire County Council. And she asks whether in light of Heathrow uh, case, uh, do we need to revisit the SA to take account of uh, the Paris Agreement? And I have to say, although when producing essays for local plans and often all falls basis uh, for an essay in relation to the national policy statement, it would be prudent to do so, prudence take into account uh, climate change issues and within that, the Paris Agreement. Uh, and I say that for two reasons. Firstly, uh, Section 19.1a of the 2004 Act requires development plans to uh, include policies 
designed to uh, mitigate climate change. Now, whilst that isn't as explicit as the Section 5 of the uh, Planning Act 2008 that uh, government policy has to be taken into account, it is at least implicit in my view in it that if one has to uh, produce policies uh, designed to secure the contribution to mitigation of climate change, that one has to have regard to government policy on climate change. And if you'd fail to do so, there's at least a, an arguable case that you've gone wrong in law. And then secondly, uh, in the Plan B case, the Court of Appeal held that there wasn't a requirement under the SEA directive and regs to okay, take account of international agreements uh, in relation to uh, environmental uh, protection. Uh, and they said in relation to uh, uh, the ANPS, uh, the Paris Agreement was an obviously relevant international agreement. Now, query whether the relevance is quite the same degree for local plans, but um, if one didn't take into account, I'm sure one would be found, uh, faced with an argument that that was a breach of the SEA directive. So uh, prudent, in my view, to take into account uh, in plan preparation and uh, in particular in the SA. Turning then back to the slides um, and the main issue in Plan B for our purposes, the SEA, the, the Court of Appeal uh, really very firmly affirmed uh, the High Court's decision and previous authority on the topic of how courts are to approach uh, challenges to uh, SAs. And in environmental, uh, sorry, in, in legal challenges to environmental uh, reports, uh, for instance, whether the content of the report is adequate to meet the SEA directive, a court will apply a Wensbury standard of review in it dismiss an argument it should apply a more intense scrutiny. And that means the courts will apply a very light scrutiny to judgments made by local planning authorities and by examining inspectors as to whether the SA uh, met the requirements of the SEA directive and regulations. For instance, questions such as whether uh, it considered all reasonable alternatives and whether it considered those reasonable alternatives in sufficient detail are all matters of judgment which the court won't interfere with unless the conclusions are irrational ones. Moving on to uh, the next topic, the third of four topics I'm dealing with, and that's the extent to which defects in the SA can be cured as part of the examination uh, uh, process. And again, this is a matter I dealt with in the previous webinar, so I'll be brief on it. It's settled law that defects in the SA can in principle uh, be cured post-submission. You're not stuck with the SA that you had undertaken as part of the Reg 19 um, uh, uh, consultation. And you can, in principle, cure any defects up to the date of uh, adoption. And that uh, authority for that proposition comes from the no agital uh, case in which Emma, um, I, I seem to recall, acted for the uh, Suffolk Coastal uh, Council. Now, I have seen a number of arguments, uh, a number of legal ar arguments advanced by eminent barristers saying, well, actually, if there are fundamental defects in the SA, they can't be cured at a very late stage in the process because that would undermine the importance of the SA being consulted on in sufficiently early that it could influence the plan. But in my view, any limitation to the no agital principle is not a legal limitation, but more of a practical one. The later in the process that you're trying to cure defects, the more significant those defects are, the more difficult it's going to be to persuade an examining inspector that the flaws have been overcome, that the SA remains objective, and that the uh, conclusions of the updated SA have been taken into account by the local planning authority with an open mind, and you're not just um, uh, providing ex post facto justifications. Uh, and I, I mentioned there briefly the Hart case, uh, where the uh, uh, local planning inspector was um, dismissed, in effect, the uh, uh, later SA as uh, retrofitting um, uh, the assessment. So if we can move on then to the final topic that I'm dealing with, and that is the uh, Leeds City Council case. A, uh, a quick run through this case, which succeeded on a number of grounds, including SCA grounds, and lessons to be learned from it. By way of context, the factual background, um, Leeds is the second largest local plan authority in the country. 
it has 11 housing market areas within its administrative area and two thirds of its area is green now in 2014 it adopted a core strategy which established a housing requirement of some 4,700 dwellings per annum over the plan period. And subsequent to that, it promoted a site allocations policy, an SAP, which allocated sites in order to meet that requirement. And uh, it, that included uh, around 13,000 dwellings which were to be removed from the green belt in order to meet the requirement. And that was submitted for examination in 2017. Uh, Emma, if you can just go back one slide. Thank you. The, at the same time, uh, the core strategy was being reviewed. And as a result of a, a reduction in uh, housing, household projections, and therefore a reduction in the housing need, there was a uh, projected lower, much lower housing requirement of around about 3,200 dwellings per annum, a reduction of 25% in the housing requirement. And that's core strategy review was submitted for examination in 2018 and was running in parallel with the site allocation uh, 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 policy. Now, the sustainability appraisal for the, for the uh, SAP involved a significant paper trail. Um, by my reckoning, and I might be wrong here, but there are about eight iterations of the SA, and the judgment in this case highlights how confusing uh, uh, they were. Indeed, there were so many iterations of the SA that a number of them weren't consulted upon. They were just put on the website amongst a plethora of other documentation. And secondly, it appears that the authority uh, didn't know about it, or at least forgotten about it because they didn't even mention some of the iterations in their SA adoption statement when they adopted the SAP. Now, unfortunately for Leeds, one of the uh, iterations of the SA that they had uh, forgotten about, as it were, and which hadn't been consulted on, um, was uh, an iteration which dealt with the reasonable alternatives uh, following the projected reduction in housing requirement. And that considered three alternatives, whether to withdraw the SAP, whether to seek main modifications, or whether to press on without main modifications. It didn't uh, consider as an alternative whether they should suspend the uh, site allocations policy pending the uh, adoption of the core strategy review uh, when there'd be greater certainty over the housing requirement number. So moving to the next slide, the uh, examination and the, the inspectors did take account of the uh, reduction in household numbers, uh, in household requirements, the projected one in, in the uh, core strategy review. And uh, they came to what might be considered by some to be a pragmatic solution. They said, well, we'll accept the uh, Greenbelt releases in the first five years of the um, site allocation policy, or at least the majority of them. But beyond that five year period, uh, we're, we're going to have main modifications to remove those from the uh, SAP because it's too uncertain given the reduction in the housing requirement. And, and that might be considered to be pragmatic because Leeds were experiencing real difficulties with demonstrating a five year supply. But one of the issues which was raised by the uh, objectors to the plan to the inspector was that on the new projected housing requirements there was a far greater reduction in the number of houses required in the first five years than the green belt releases for those five years and that begged the question why do we need those green belt releases at all why couldn't the housing requirement the new projected housing requirement uh, not be met on non green belt sites and the real problem for Leeds, and, and, and the lesson to be learned, which we'll come on to, is that it's, it would appear that Leeds didn't, and certainly the inspector didn't, grapple with that issue. They didn't explain why, notwithstanding the reduction in num housing numbers, the Greenbelt releases were still required. Now, one can think of a number of reasons why they may still have been required. Uh, they could have been the most sustainable sites. Um, they uh, could be the sites that were going to deliver earlier in the period. But because they didn't uh, grapple with it, that caused them some significant issues when it came to the legal challenge. And we'll come on to the next slide where we deal with the judgment. First of all, in relation to um, non-SEA grounds, um, 
the, the, the court said that the inspect, there were inadequate reasons given by the inspectors as to why there are exceptional circumstances, which we know is the, the, the test in national policy to um, uh, amend green belt boundaries. That there was inadequate reasons given why there are exceptional circumstances to release a large number of green belt sites in the first five years of the plan in light of the significant reduction in the hazard requirement. Now, importantly, the court weren't saying you couldn't come to the conclusion there are exceptional circumstances. That's a matter of applying judgment. But it was a, an issue which cried out for um, adequate reasons, and no reasons were given. The second basis on which, uh, non SEA based on which the uh, 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 finding of the SAP was unlawful, was that there was an error of fact in relation to the updates about the supply of housing. And the inspectors had simply got very confused about an update provided by the local planning authority. Moving then to the SEA ground, there were two. Uh, SEA grounds. First of all, uh, it was said that there was an error of law because the uh, local planning authority failed to consider or consult on the reasonable alternative of suspending the SAP pending the outcome of the core strategy review. And secondly, and separately, they said that the approach to site selection was irrational because it had been taken on an individual housing market area basis rather than the broader plan area. Dealing with the first um, of those challenges, that in substance succeeded. Um, the court held in the context suspending the uh, site allocation policy pending the adoption of the core strategy, so it, there could be certainty on them, but it was an alternative, uh, an obvious alternative, and should have been clearly and transparently consulted upon. I, I have to say, for my part, I think that's a surprising result. Um, the SEA directive requires reasonable alternatives to the implementation of the plan, taking account of the plan's objectives. It doesn't require considerations of alternative plans. Now, if one is suspending or not implementing a plan, one is obviously not meeting the plan's objectives. Uh, therefore, I think there's a good argument, at least, that um, suspending or withdrawing plans, whilst alternatives in the broad sense, are not reasonable alternatives for the purposes of the SEA directive. But for whatever it, uh, it, uh, the reason, it appears that that line of argument may not have been run and the court um, concluded it was a reasonable alternative. And I think the real issue was that the uh, local plan authority had considered as a reasonable alternative the withdrawal of the SAP um, in that SA iteration that got lost, but hadn't consulted upon it. But having said all that, uh, the court refused relief, having found unlawfulness, because it considered that even if it had consulted on suspending the uh, SAP pending the uh, core strategy review, the court council's position would never have been the same given its uh, position uh, uh, as set out in the examination. Turning then to the second basis uh, on which the, the, the plan was challenged on an SEA ground, and that was the methodology of the site selection. And this ground of challenge was really given very short shrift by the court. Um, it's an example, really, of the courts taking a light touch approach, uh, applying the Wensbury uh, uh, unreasonableness criteria to judgments taken by a local planning authority as to how to assess the reasonable alternatives. Uh, that said, the court did remark that neither the council nor the inspector had set out the it adequately its reasons for. Um, the uh, methodology it adopted. So following that quick canter, what are the lessons we can learn from these? And indeed, the, the, the Guildford case. The first is that when you're undertaking or promoting a local plan for an examination, you have to be ready for a change in circumstances. It happened in Guildford and it formed the basis or the central basis of challenge in that case. Uh, and as James alluded to, one of the reasons that Guildford were able to stave off that challenge is that, that it reacted to those changes in circumstances and explained its position. It happened in Leeds, and because Leeds didn't do so or didn't do so adequately, and the inspectors therefore didn't address that uh, question, it led to a finding of unlawfulness. Secondly, if changes do occur, face up to them, uh, as James says, don't dismiss uh, those uh, objections which have said changes do occur, you need to grapple with this. 
be ready to explain why continuing with the plan strategy is appropriate or why uh, necessary modifications are required. Thirdly, as part of that, ask yourself whether you need to reevaluate the sustainability appraisal, particularly whether reasonable alternatives have changed. So if, for example, there's a reduction in the housing uh, need figures or housing requirement figures, it may mean that alternatives which you have dismissed as being unreasonable previously are now to be considered as reasonable. Fourthly, um, if you do produce an updated uh, sustainability appraisal, don't hide it on your website. Don't uh, put it up there with a plethora of other documents. Do consult it on it. And don't, for whatever uh, you do, forget its existence when you come to draft the SA adoption statement. Fifthly, ensure that updates that you provide to the uh, examining inspectors, particularly in relation to housing numbers, are easy to follow. It's invariably the case that throughout an examination, you need to update on the housing trajectory, on completions, on the number of permissions granted. But they need to be set out in a clear form so errors of fact um, uh, don't occur. And sixthly, take some comfort in the court's approach. If you do address those matters required by the SEA directive and regulations, and you come to judgments um, in relation to how uh, those matters should be assessed, in particular how reasonable alternatives should be assessed, and you explain your reasons for uh, taking the particular approach, courts are, are likely to be very slow to interfere with those judgments. Uh, and with no further ado, looking at time, I'll pass on to uh, Emma to deal with Habitat's regulations. Thanks very much, Rob. Um, just checking my, taking my mute off. Yeah, great. Thank you. Um, I'm going to talk uh, mainly today about three important European cases from the last couple of years, um, which illustrate potential problem areas, and they're really all to do with um, mitigation measures um, that might be proposed um, in, in either projects or plans to address um, habitats' impacts. Um, so I want to talk about those cases and then just give some thoughts about how the lessons from those cases might apply to the local plan process. Um, and then if there's time at the end, I've, I've got a few slides on some miscellaneous points. Um, but I'll just start with a quick overview um, of the requirement for um, an appropriate assessment or habitats regulations assessment, as it's sometimes called. There are two key concepts um, from Article 6.3 of the Habitats Directive. The first is um, the concept of likely significant effects. And the second is the, con is the concept of adverse effects on integrity. Um, and in terms of the process, the appropriate assessment process that's followed, likely significant effects are the, the trigger for carrying out an appropriate assessment. So um, in contrast to um, environmental impact assessment, there isn't a formal requirement for screening when it comes to habitats regulations. However, it's good practice, and as I'm sure you'll all be um, well aware, that that's very commonly carried out, um, both for projects and for plans. The second stage of the process, is the key one, is the appropriate assessment itself. The role of that assessment is to determine whether there will be adverse effects on the integrity of the site. Um, so it's got, it's got to be a thorough assessment, it's rigorous, uh, and I just note there the standard of certainty which is required. Um, it's no reasonable scientific doubt. So that's the level um, of certainty that has to be reached when you're concluding that there won't be adverse effects on the integrity of the European site. So that is a pretty stringent threshold. Um, and then the, the third, I suppose, stage in the process um, is the possibility of compensatory measures, but they're only relevant if essentially you've had a negative appropriate assessment, adverse effects can't be ruled out with certainty, but the plan or project still needs to go ahead. And that's just a very brief overview. Without further ado, I'll get on to the first case that I want to talk about. Um, and it concerns these gnaw pearl mussels, which are threatened with extinction due to sedimentation of the river gnaw in Ireland. Uh, and this was a case about a project the project being to lay a cable connecting a wind farm to the grid and the claimants were concerned about silt and sediments washing into the river and harming the mussels. This was about um, mitigation measures 
at the screening stage. There was a screening opinion carried out uh, that concluded that with mitigation measures that have been designed into the project, there would be no likely significant effects on the European site and therefore uh, an appropriate assessment wasn't needed. So that project was effectively screened out in the process. Um, the court uh, eventually got to the Court of Justice for the European Union um, that noted that the inclusion, the very fact that protective measures had been included indicated that there could be adverse effects which needed to be reduced. And therefore, by screening out the project and taking, taking account the mitigation in the screening stage, the effect of that was to avoid the full rigour of a full appropriate assessment and that requirement of certainty that I've already mentioned. Um, in addition to that, there is a consultation requirement um, in Article 60 of the Habitats Directive. So if no appropriate assessment takes place, that's also, that has also been avoided. So the, the, the principle that came out of this case is that at the screening stage of a Habitats Regulations Assessment, any mitigation measures, measures that are intended to avoid or reduce harm, have to be ignored. So you have to assess the project or for our purposes the plan on the assumption that mitigation measures uh, won't, uh, won't be provided at least for the purposes of screening. And clearly the court was concerned to ensure that the directive would be fully effective when it, when it laid down that principle. In terms of how that applies to plan making, um, certainly the guidance that's come out since that case has, has been mainly focused on projects i.e. planning applications. Um, and indeed the PPG only refers to um, projects in, in, in its guidance. It draws a distinction between um, measures which have specifically been added to avoid or reduce harmful effects, which are to be ignored in screening, um, and features that are integral to the design or physical characteristics of the project, um, and says that those can be taken into account. So example might be the fact that the um, a strategic allocation is uh, a certain distance away from the boundary of the European site, that's something that may be integral to that allocation and something that could be taken into account when screening for likely significant effects. But any landscaping measures or provision of green space within that allocation would be uh, a harm avoidance or reduction measure, which would have to be ignored. Um, in terms of local plans, there was a, a, a note provided by PINS um, which confirmed there wasn't any authoritative definition on what are integral features and what are additional avoidance measures. I've just given a couple of examples there. The guidance, I have to say, is, isn't particularly helpful in taking matters much further. Um, I think it's fair to say a, a cautious approach is probably safest when screening um, for likely significant effects when it comes to plans. In terms of practical lessons from this case, I think check, check the appropriate assessments, ensure that impacts aren't being screened out on the basis of mitigation, but that any mitigation is being considered as part of the full appropriate assessment. I think the Guildford case um, was an example of this and, and some amendments were made to the appropriate assessment a bit further down the line to improve clarity because there was an impression given initially that certain effects had been screened out um, and of course it's worth remembering as Rob's alluded to that that appropriate assessment can always be reviewed and amended as you go on so long as you reconsult because for appropriate assessment habitats directive the legal duty is for the process to be complete and for the necessary certainty to exist at the point of adoption so um, even if you spot some problems in relation to mitigation, um, that's something that is capable of being corrected before the plan is adopted. Um, in terms of types of, of mitigation measures that would therefore potentially need to be excluded from screening, I've set out some there um, that are commonly used in local plans. Um, and I think Nicholas Swan asked a question about methods of mitigation that might be sufficient uh, to persuade an inspector to accept local plan proposals where the uh, directive is engaged. I think it all depends on what the proposal is, what the impacts are and where they've been taken into account in the process. 
um, I don't think we can give an answer as to what methods of mitigation might be suitable in the abstract, but these are certainly um, commonly used mitigation measures that you need to take care um, with, with screening to make sure that you're not um, wrongly screening uh, impacts out on the basis of these types of things. So my, my second case then um, concerns an area of habitat for, for this bird, the rare hen harrier. Again, it's a case about a wind farm in Ireland. Um, this time the wind farm was proposed to be built in the SPA itself, which would involve a loss of habitat. Um, and in order to address the impacts of that, um, it was proposed that part, another part of the SPA would be restored to more favourable habitat and that there would be an ongoing management strategy for other areas. Um, and, and that was the fact that those matters were taken into account was the subject of the challenge. So this case is all about um, what can be taken account now at the actual appropriate assessment stage. Um, and as I say, the appropriate assessment itself took account of those measures, the, the habitat restoration, the management strategy, and was therefore able to conclude that there wouldn't be an adverse effect on the integrity of the European site as a result of the wind farm. Um, the court, uh, the European court, took the view that these measures were not actually mitigating in the sense that they weren't seeking to avoid or reduce um, adverse effects, rather they were um, measures that were compensating effects rather than the event really for, for negative impacts. So there's a distinction drawn in this case between um, protective avoiding and avoidance and reduction measures and measures that are compensating for negative effects. Um, the court said that a measure can only be taken into account at the appropriate assessment stage where it's sufficiently certain that it will make an effective contribution to avoiding harm. Therefore, if the measure is actually in reality compensating, it has to be disregarded in the appropriate assessment. It can be considered um, at the third stage. I, at the beginning, I, I went through those three stages of the process. It can be considered um, under Article 6.4 if the result of the appropriate assessment is negative. Um, the reason for this line of thinking is that if, if compensation measures are taken into account as part of the appropriate assessment, that might allow a project to proceed, proceed despite the fact that it would have an adverse effect on the integrity of the site um, in cases where the test for, for compensatory measures wouldn't otherwise be met. So again, the court here is particularly concerned to ensure the elements of the plan or project concerned um, are considered at the correct point in the appropriate assessment process. And again, that the aims of the directive aren't being undermined um, or circumvented by um, taking account of measures at the wrong stage. So that of course was about a project. How does that apply um, to plan making? Um, well, obviously it highlights the need to consider whether um, mitigation measures that are being taken into account in the appropriate assessment of the plan are actually um, measures that are intending to prevent the harm, harm from happening or to minimise it, or in fact whether they're essentially offsetting um, harm that's going to occur. It's worth pointing out that the, the European cases on this point have pretty much all concerned direct loss of protected habitat and measures um, that have been intended to offset that. There's at least three cases, recent cases in that, of that type. Um, and obviously where you're, where you're proposing replacement habitat or um, trying to offset loss of habitat, that's more obviously compensatory. It's, it's not so usual for a local plan to propose a direct um, impact on, on a European site to, to actually cite a development, a strategic, strategic allocation in a European site and thereby um, have a loss of habitat, the impacts tend to be more indirect in nature. So things like recreational disturbance, um, depositing nitrogen, maybe impact on water quality. Um, and so the strategies and policies that are in place, I think it's fair to say, are usually intended to avoid those kind of indirect impacts, for example, by diverting uh, recreational pressures away to alternative green space um, or to ensure development is limited within buffer zones, that sort of thing. So I think there's not so much of a risk that that type of measure would be 
thought of as compensation, compensation rather than mitigation. Um, just a quick point on Article 6.4, if, if, if you do get to that stage, it is a very high hurdle. Uh, if, the, if adverse effects on the site can't be excluded um, by the appropriate assessment, then you can only then adopt the plan if there are no alternative solutions and there are imperative reasons of overriding public interest. Um, and those are obviously pretty high thresholds. I'm not going to go into those right now. But it, uh, then if you can cross those thresholds, it's then that the compensation measures um, may then become relevant. So clearly, if you can't take into account those kind of measures in the assessment itself, um, it's leaving you in a difficult position. So if I come on to my third case then, this arose from litigation in the Netherlands where the National Court ruled that an authorisation scheme for agriculture projects um, which give rise to nitrogen emissions was in breach of the Habitats Directive. The result of that national um, court judgment was that all new projects covered by the scheme were brought to a halt. It was then suggested by politicians that a way of dealing with that crisis was to um, basically reduce the number of livestock in the Netherlands by half because that was a main cause of nitrogen emissions. Um, and this picture was the result of, of that suggestion. So that litigation went up to the European Court, um, and I'm not even going to attempt to read out the full name of the case, but happily, it's, it's commonly referred to as the Dutch nitrogen case. Actually, there were two joint cases. I'm not going to go through the facts in great detail, other than to highlight the, the, the point that this was a really highly complex permitting scheme um, based on the idea of defining a critical nitrogen limits for different areas of land, and then those limits were the basis for whether um, agricultural activities would be authorised or not. And the idea was that the, that scheme would then create some headroom because there were already um, too high limits in many areas, which would allow new activities to take place um, and, uh, and essentially for economic reasons. So the scheme required um, pretty complex calculations um, in which the effects of a whole range of factors had to be taken into account in combination. So there were site-specific measures, measures directed at the sources of nitrogen, there was monitoring and adjustment, there were, there were improvements to the baseline, all of which um, were factored into, into this scheme. Now, the scheme itself was subject to appropriate assessment, but there was, there was not then um, a further appropriate assessment needed for the individual projects under the scheme. Um, and so what the, the court said in this case, they were repeating a point made previously in the Grayson Sweetman case uh, about the difficulty of forecasting future benefits with certainty. In that case, as I've indicated, it was about creating and restoring habitats. Um, but here the court was saying these are long term measures. They're going to take effect in the future. Some of them are going to have to be renewed. Um, they haven't they haven't happened yet, they haven't yielded results yet, so the effects are still uncertain. Uh, and the key point from this case, I think, is that the, court, the court's concerns about whether the right level of certainty could exist for the appropriate assessment to rule out adverse effects were based at least in part on, on the mere fact that the measures in question hadn't yet been implemented, so no results have been seen. It's the very fact that the measures would take into effect into the future that was seen as problematic. So in terms of the implications of that, um, really they're still to be worked out. Um, I mean, the, sort of on the face of it, that case seems to be suggesting that any measures that will take effect in the future, um, it's going to be hard to achieve the required level of certainty um, for, those, for those kind of measures. And the Advocate General essentially confirmed that saying that it's naturally very difficult to overcome that requirement in the case of future measures and developments. So that's, that's really hard to reconcile with the fact that appropriate assessment um, is, is by its very nature concerned with forecasting the future, what is going to happen to this site if this plan is adopted um, or this project goes ahead. Um, and, and that contradiction was acknowledged by the Advocate General, but no real answer was provided. And clearly the system as a whole has to be workable. If you take those comments by the court, literally it would almost be impossible to rely on any mitigation measures and the system would just grind to a halt. So thinking about local plan mitigation, how, how can that 
kind of certainty um, be provided. I think it's important to, to distinguish the kind of measures we're talking about for local plans with the facts of Dutch nitrogen. As I've indicated, that was, was highly complex and untested as a scheme. Um, so it's not that surprising that the court was, was a bit concerned about it, whereas um, things like SANG, SAM, um, those sort of avoidance strategies, they're commonly used, they're not so complex, they're more tried and tested. Um, an, an example, um, recent example from the North Essex uh, authorities, part one local plan, which has been un found unsound, but not for habitats reasons. The inspector there found that a, a SAMS type of strategy, a, a recreational avoidance mitigation strategy, uh, provided a high degree of certainty that recreational pressures, pressures will not lead to adverse effects. So these kind of mitigation measures um, are, are being taken into account and are being relied on. I think there is still some potential problems with it, which may well be worked through in, in, in later litigation. Um, these kind of SAM strategies, for example, they involve ongoing monitoring to measure effectiveness um, of the measures. So that perhaps generates some uncertainty about will the measures change in the future? Therefore, can we be certain uh, about what the effects are going to be of those measures? And in terms of policy wordings, um, protective policies or, or requirements for um, contributions or on-site measures and that sort of thing, um, they're always subject, of course, to Section 38.6 and the possibility of material considerations overriding conflicts. So one could see potential arguments about certainty in that respect as well. I think ultimately we'll have to see how that principle works itself out in further litigation, either in this country or before the European court. I think it's fair to say that the UK courts are much more uh, willing to take a, it seems to me, a, a pragmatic um, approach and a kind of hands-off approach, whereas the European court seems to be a lot more uh, stringent in, in, in its approach to these cases. We were asked a question about whether we're aware of any forthcoming cases um, on habitats, and I suppose particularly on these issues. Um, I'm, I'm not aware of them, um, others might be more informed than I am, but there are certainly um, well-known firms who would be keen to take on these kind of points. Um, two, two sort of further points on, on plan making here. Firstly, subjective certainty and one line of defence against challenges based on um, the fact that measures are not sufficiently certain to, um, to rule out adverse effects. Um, was confirmed recently in the Guildford case, actually, the, the, the idea that um, the standard required can't be absolute certainty because that's almost impossible to attain. Uh, the conclusion that there will be no adverse effect is a matter of judgment for the local authority. It's necessarily subjective and therefore it's possible for the local authority itself to be satisfied that there won't be adverse effects, even though it can't objectively be proved with absolute certainty that that that, that will be the case. Um, and as Rob's alluded to, if, if there is a challenge to the plan, um, it's going to be for the claimant to show that the judgment that the local authority has reached on these kind of points is irrational. Um, I think that, that that's obviously not an easy um, standard to meet. Uh, and if, if the points are all being dealt with properly and the issues are grappled with, that will put the local authority on a, on a more secure footing. Um, I was going to say just briefly on multi-stage processes, one possible way of dealing with uncertainty at the plan stage is, of course, the fact that appropriate assessment will be needed at the planning application stage. So for strategic, for strategic allocations, um, it may be possible to have policies which essentially uh, require project level appropriate assessments to which can take account of site specific mitigation. Um, to avoid adverse effects and therefore conclude that the plan itself will not have adverse effects. That was an approach taken in the Noah Dastral Newtown uh, case um, that was mentioned earlier. Um, so if that's something that you want to think about, I'll point you in the direction of that case. Um, I'm on to the three miscellaneous slides. I'm seeing the time. We're pretty much out of time. Um, I'm going to just deal with one of them which is just Brexit, um, just as a footnote, really. Um, we had a question from Beth Harris about how the requirements 
um, the EU regulation requirements would change as a consequence of Brexit. Uh, I think the short point is that both for um, Habitats and for SCA at the moment, the proposal is simply to tweak the uh, domestic regulations just to make them workable in the UK only context. So to remove references to, to EU um, institutions and concepts, uh, but that the substance of the duties uh, will remain the same. However, it's obviously a fluid situation. Um, Boris Johnson recently talked about new counting delays whether that was a, a serious suggestion that um, things will change on this front, we don't know. So watch this space on that. Um, right, hopefully that was helpful. I'll hand back over to James um, to pick up on any questions that have come through during the presentation. Thank you very much, Emma. Uh, very briefly then, we've had two questions come in, both um, are luckily for Rob. He's gonna deal with them and then I'm gonna pick up one final issue from um, the earlier questions and record it today then. So over to you, Rob. Thanks, James. Um, two questions. The first one, Karu. Uh, the, uh, the question is, many local authorities have declared a climate emergency and set a zero carbon target by 2030, which is our earlier than national target. Should it be or can it be included in the SA objectives? Well, first of all, um, not to answer your question directly, you know, I'm not a politician, but um, you certainly, in my view, can take into account uh, that policy that local planning authorities have adopted as part of your uh, preparation for the plan, and in particular under the section 19 1A, where you're um, uh, producing policies which um, mitigate climate change. So there's no doubt, in my view, you can take account there. Whether you can take account as an essay objective in itself is, is perhaps um, more of a difficult question. Um, there, are, there is a line of thought that essay objectives should be neutral or policy off, uh, uh, um, but to my view, that's wrong. I mean, any uh, essay objective is going to have a policy on uh, dimension. And if the local planning authority have considered that this particular policy, um, zero carbon target by 2030, is an important sustainability um, objective. Uh, I don't see why uh, you can't include that within the SA objective, so long as you reason it clearly. And if you do that and you reason it clearly, I can't see it being struck down uh, by a court as being um, unlawful. The second question uh, by Karen was in relation to the Leeds case, and the question um, was in effect whether the uh, conclusions in relation to the site selection methodology related uh, only to the fact that it was a Greenbelt release or whether it related more broadly. And the answer I think is more broadly, if for whatever reason you're, you've, under, you've um, established a methodology for site, site selection, whether you're a Greenbelt authority or not a Greenbelt authority, um, I think Leeds is um, good authority for the proposition that that methodology is a matter for the decision maker uh, and the courts won't interfere unless that methodology is an irrational one. Of course, you need to persuade the inspector who isn't applying that rationality um, review uh, that the uh, site section um, process and methodology is, is robust. But in terms of court um, challenges, uh, they're going to take a, a hands-off approach, um, whether it's a green belt question uh, or not. Thank you very much, Rob. The last question I'm going to pick up very briefly came from uh, Rob Snowling, and it's, he picks up the point that in the test for soundness um, within the framework, uh, which has moved from Para 182 to Para 35, there is a slight alteration in that now one of the tests is that you have an appropriate strategy, not the most appropriate strategy. In our view, there's, there's no significance, real significance in that difference. It's obviously a lowering of the test, but uh, in our experience, uh, most inspectors would have applied uh, a, a sense of judgment to that anyway, and provided it was appropriate, they were unlikely to refuse uh, to conclude that the plan was signed and that it was not the most appropriate. So I um, don't see any more questions, just uh, remains for me to thank you for listening. Uh, Apologise we've overrun slightly. Thank Rob and Emma in particular for their significant contributions and to remind you that the slides and the broadcast will be available and to encourage you to
attend the further uh, series, um, three uh, webinars in the series. So thank you very much and good afternoon. <laughs>